Hi hey class, this is chapter nine regarding nutrients involved in fluid and electrolyte balance. So introduction, we're gonna talk a lot about water and electrolytes. Water is the most abundant molecule in our body and we're gonna talk about it coming up. Men and women have slightly different amounts of water. We do have to consume water daily, it's crucial to life. And then fluid balance relies on electrolytes. These are elements that have charges, so sodium, chloride, potassium, and phosphorus. And electrolytes help regulate the distribution of water, control acid base, which is the pH of our blood, and help facilitate nerve impulses. So how much of the human body is water? I said it did depend on if you are a man or a woman, um, but in general, it's about 50 to 70%. It's also more in younger people versus older people, and it is more in men versus women. Can we survive without water? What do you think? Hopefully you said no. Water is a solvent. That more means it's a transport vehicle for nutrients and wastes. And so solutes or molecules can dissolve in water and be transported through water. We can expel waste products through water via our sweat and our respiration um, and uh, our urine primarily. It helps facilitate chemical reactions and it also participates in chemical reactions, and it helps lubricate joints and provide fluids to everywhere our body produces fluids, like saliva, mucus that lines our GI tract, um, mucus that lines our respiratory tract, cerebral spinal fluid, amniotic fluid, etc. So this is comparing men and women and what their bodies are made of. You can see that men have a little bit um, less, sorry, men have less protein than women. These, the way that this is organized isn't that great. Men have more protein than women and men have less fat than women. So these, these are not exactly organized that well. Um, but if you look at fat, women have much more fat than men and men have much more protein than women. Um, this is as far as pounds go, but also as far as percent goes, because this man and woman don't weigh the same much. And men have more water than women. Water is bound to muscle in our body, and women have more fat, therefore they have less muscle. Functions of water. I already indicated a few functions of water, but this is additional functions of water that we're going to be talking about coming up. And you should definitely know how water functions in our body. So the first function of water is temperature control. And the temperature of our body is highly important. Um, maintaining our body temperature around the correct temperature allows for enzymes to work. Um, and without this, enzymes could be denatured. Remember, enzymes are often proteins. And with high heat, proteins can be denatured and reactions could slow down. So water, water um, changes its temperature pretty slowly because it, holds the, it has the ability to hold heat. And so water can help us maintain our body core at a pretty warm temperature. If we need that temperature to change a little quicker, we sweat, we secrete water to the outside of our body, and then by evaporation, the temperature goes down and heat is released. Also, our blood vessels become bigger and our blood vessels can become dilated and this can cause the blood flow, the blood that's flowing through our body to cool down some. When we eat foods and break them down, we generate heat. Moisture, lubrication, and cooking, cushioning. So water-based secretions, can you think of some? Here we have a tear, so obviously tears, but also mucus, sweat, urine, saliva. The mucus that's in your respiratory canal, your GI canal, joint fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, and amniotic fluid. 
how much water should you drink? So um, the adequate intake for total water is 2.7 liters, which is about 11 cups for women, and 3.7 liters, which is about 15 cups for men. However, we do get a lot of fluids from non-water sources, and things that can contribute to fluid are fruits and vegetables. Many fruits and vegetables are 80 to 90% water. Meats can contribute to fluids. Even meats are 50% water. Um, soups, popsicles, jello, yogurt, ice cubes, um, ice cream, anything that would melt at room temperature would contribute to water. Also coffee, tea, lemonade, soda, juice, etc. So this chart shows water balance and where we get our water compared to how we use and lose the water. So most of our water that we get is from fluids by us drinking it. We also get water from food sources. And then water, H2O, is actually a byproduct of metabolism. So our body actually makes water. How we lose or use water, we lose most of our water in the form of urine and sweat. And then we also lose some water from lung respirations. Just think about your breath um, against the window on a cold day or when it's really cold, you don't even have to blow against a window. You could just see it. And then feces as well. So normally you don't lose that much water in your stool because most of it is absorbed. Um, but if somebody has diarrhea, they could be losing a lot of water in their stool. So this is looking at water output. And water output is really important because our main, um, our main route of water output is urine. And urine is very important because with the urine, out goes a lot of toxic byproducts of metabolism, for example, nitrogens, um, urea from protein breakdown. And so the minimum amount of water that our kidneys need in order to make urine and get rid of these wastes is about 500 milliliters per day or half of a liter per day. However, luckily most people consume much more than that. The max that um, most people urinate per day is, well, not the max, the average is about 1,650. Sweat could be up to one liter of sweat. You can measure your sweat by weighing clothing before and after exercise and calculating the change in weight. And then breathing and expiration, you can lose water as well as feces. So what happens when our body fluids are depleted and how do we restore our body fluids. This is really important. Um, when we have low body fluids, meaning we're dehydrated, we haven't drinking enough water, we're sweating a lot, or we've had maybe vomiting or diarrhea, two things happen. So first of all, our kidneys sense a decreased blood flow because there's less blood because of less water. The kidneys notice this. And they activate an enzyme cascade that involves angiotensin and aldosterone. This causes reabsorption of sodium and chloride, which then causes increased water retention by the kidneys and less is excreted in the urine and fluid balance is restored. The other thing that happens when fluid balance is low is osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus can sense that the blood is becoming more concentrated, meaning sodium levels are getting too high, electric, electrolyte levels are getting too high. And this signals the pituitary gland to release antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone causes the kidney to retain more water and urine output is reduced. So antidiuretic is like anti-diarrhea. However, it's not diarrhea from the stool. It's a diuresis of your body. Dehydration. So... As we become dehydrated, we actually lose a pretty significant amount of body weight because water makes up so much of our bodies. So between 0 to 2% of our body weight lost in fluids, we start feeling thirsty. So maybe this is if you're sweating a lot or if you've been throwing up or 
vomiting, had diarrhea, been sick, you start feeling thirsty. At 2%, this is a strong thirst. You can have loss of appetite, trouble concentrating. Um, 4%, emotional instability, flush skin, drowsiness. 6%, you might feel some tingling, have difficulties controlling your temperature. 8%, trouble breathing. 10%, muscle cramps, kidney, kidney function failing, and over 10% increased risk of death. The problem with this is we don't feel thirsty until we are already a little bit dehydrated. So thirst doesn't come in until you've already lost, you know, zero to two percent of your body weight in fluids. How can we tell if we're dehydrated before perhaps we feel thirst? So looking at our pee is a really good idea. And usually the darker the pee, the more dehydrated we are. The lighter the pee, the more hydrated we are. Certain things can throw this off a little bit. If you take B vitamin supplements, those B vitamins often make your pee look kind of yellow or orangish, even if you are well hydrated, but your pee can generally be a good indicator. So it can be both color and frequency. Are you going to the bathroom frequently or have you only gone once the entire day? Thirst is good, but like I said, it does kind of lag. And for certain individuals, it lags more than others. So for, um, Elderly, they don't feel thirsty even when they are dehydrated. They report thirst after much more body weight has been lost due to dehydration. The sick often don't feel as thirsty. Children don't have quite an, um, a potent thir me thirst mechanism. Infants, they might be thirsty, but they can't talk to you about their thirst. And so for these people, looking at the pee is really important. And then athletes drinking more than what they need and more than they lose is, is also very important because athletes might be sweating a lot. And additionally, when we drink water, we can't actually absorb 100% of that. We only absorb about 60% of it. So for an athlete, they should drink more than they're actually losing. Okay, can you drink too much? The answer to this is absolutely. You can overhydrate yourself. And when you drink too much water, the problem is that the electrolytes, um, the sodium, potassium, chloride, phosphorus, in your bloodstream become diluted, meaning there are not enough of them compared to how much water you have. Sometimes this happens in endurance athletes if they are exercising too much and sweating a lot, but just drinking water and not drinking any sort of electrolyte drink. Um, this can cause headaches, confusion, seizure, coma, and death. So I, I don't always support the use of sports drinks like Gatorade or Powerade, but Gatorade or Powerade can be good, especially if somebody's sweating a lot because they do contain small amounts of some of those electrolytes. So they reduce the chances of overhydration. Also some long distance athletes like long distance runners um, might get electrolyte supplements like electrolyte gummies or jelly beans, or some of them even will um, take salt packets with them and eat salt while they're running if they're sweating a lot. Hard versus soft water. So this has to do with the water that comes out of your tap. And most homes in the U.S. have hard water. It's hard because it contains hard minerals. It contains calcium and magnesium. And is this good or bad? Generally speaking, calcium and magnesium are both helpful minerals to humans. And so generally speaking, this is not bad. Why it might be bad or some people might perceive it as bad is this hard water is a little bit more difficult to wash with and soaps don't get as lathery with the hard water as compared to the soft. If you want to soften your water, you can do so with a water soft softener, which can be installed in your house or um, can be in the form of like a filter in um, a pitcher that you could pour the water through the filter and then drink. Soft water is high in sodium and this can potentially be negative if people are cooking a lot with that water, drinking with that water, etc. If somebody has 
what's called a salt sensitive hypertension or salt sensitive high blood pressure and they're getting extra sodium in their water that could put them at further risk for increasing their blood pressure even higher so there's no need for extra sodium in our water why would people even want soft water? Soft water feels soft. Um, it's nice and smooth and it does wash. It helps you wash easily. The soap gets really lathery and it's, it's good for cleaning. Calcium and magnesium also can leave deposits, um, mineral deposits on your bathroom, like the faucet and the shower doors. So you might have seen these in your home. Bottled versus tap water. So there's a lot of perception and um, potentially misinformation that bottled water is better for people. However, the same standards apply to both water that is bottled and water that comes out of the tap. It's slightly different agencies that regulate them. The EPA, or Environmental Protection Agency, um, regulates tap water, and the FDA, or Food and Drug Administration, regulates bottled water. Usually tap water is fortified with fluoride because fluoride has been shown to reduce ca cavities when added to our water sources, but bottled water is not fortified with fluoride. So there's potential risk there. Tips for water consumption. So plastic Bottles create a lot of waste. You saw them on the pictures in the previous slide. And so if you do want to drink water, which hopefully you do, there are some tips that can help improve your health as well as the health of the environment. So stainless steel bottles are great because um, they're reusable, they're sturdy, uh, they're really low risk for bacteria to colonize them. They don't dent or scratch very easily. If you do use plastic, look for plastics that have recycling codes two and four. These are plastics that can be recycled and break down with little to no um, difficulty in landfills. Look for BPA-free bottles. BPA is bisphenol A, and this is a compound that's used in plastic production. It's been used since the early 1900s. Um, but BPA has been found to be a endocrine disruptor, meaning it can disrupt hormone levels. And so we do not want BPA in our plastics, especially plastics that you know we might heat or cook or plastics that are going to be used over and over again and might get dented, etc. Choosing reusable bottles with wide mouths. Wide mouths are great because you can put ice into them. Um, if you're backpacking, you can scoop snow with them, and they just make it easy for you to store whatever you want in that bottle. If they're scratched and cracked, throw them away. That's because bacteria can colonize those little crack spaces and start to grow and then put risk, you at risk. And then don't store water in a hot area or drink water that's been exposed to heat, especially water in plastic bottles because those plastics can start to break down and leach into the water. Fluid within the body. So we already discussed that our bodies have about 50 to 70% fluid. And so where is this fluid? This fluid is in intracellular and extracellular space. So intracellular means inside the cells. And extracellular is outside the cells. And extracellular includes the plasma and the fluids that are between the cells. And keeping the fluid where it's supposed to be in our body is really important. And ions are responsible for this, as well as proteins. Um, if you have too much fluid in the extracellular space, it can cause the cells to shrink and it can cause edema, which is swelling, um, commonly seen in the ankles, etc. Electrolytes. So uh, electrolytes are charged ions that can allow the transfer of an electrical current. And so they are sodium, potassium, which both have positive charges, chloride, and phosphorus, which have negative charges. And some of these are inside the cell and some of these are outside of the cell. So 
outside of the cell we find sodium and chloride, so one with a positive charge, one with a negative, and inside the cell we find potassium and phosphorus. Okay, so osmosis. So osmosis refers to transfer or movement or passage of water through membranes, such as in a cell, from an area of low electrolyte concentration to an area of high electrolyte concentration. So in these diagrams, red is represented by, um, or red indicates water molecules, and this gray circle indicates solute molecules. So for example, the solute might be sodium. So in an isotonic solution, there is the same amount of sodium inside and outside of the cell, and water can move in and out of the cells freely. In a hypotonic solution, the concentration of that sodium or solute is greater inside than outside of the cell. And so water will move into the cell and as water moves into the cell, that cell will expand. Eventually things will equalize, but initially that cell will expand. In a hypertonic solution, there is more solute or sodium, in this example, outside of the cell, and so water will move outside of the cell to try to balance that. And as water moves outside of the cell, the cell shrinks. When cells shrink, they do not function anymore, um, or they do not function as effectively. When cells swell, they can potentially burst, and then they don't function either. So having the correct amount of ions or solutes inside and outside of the cell is very important. This process of osmosis is what the cells of our digestive tract use to absorb water and sodium. So the cells in our colon are called the colonocytes. And in the colon, water will move into the colonocytes. And this will prevent dehydration. When you're sick or vomiting, you can lose a lot of fluids. When you lose a lot of fluids, the substance outside of the cell is going to be more concentrated, and so water is going to move outside of the cell to try to balance that out. Cells can shrink, and this can lead to heart problems, um, decreased ability of the heart to pump blood, and eventually cardiac arrest or heart attack. Electrical impulses. So, electrolytes are able to carry electric signals, and they do this to transmit nerve impulses. So remember, our electrolytes are charged. They have either negative or positive charges, and there are certain electrolytes that are found inside the cell and certain electrolytes that are found outside of the cell. So, do I have a picture of this? I think I do coming up. Yeah, I do have a picture of this coming up. So, if sodium is pumped outside of a cell, sodium has a positive charge. Then, to replace that positive charge, potassium is pumped in. But potassium is slower to go into the cell than sodium is to go out, and so for a while, that cell has a negative charge. When a stimulus occurs, and so this is like an environmental stimulus, like say you stub your toe or you drink a hot coffee or you prick your finger with a needle um, or you get a shot, that's a, that's a stimulus, an environmental stimulus. And it results in what's called a depolarization reaction. It's gonna stimulate your nerves. So sodium quickly goes back into the cell to help that cell get back to positive. And this is called depolarization. And this happens in a sequence along the nerve cells. So this can pass from one nerve cell to the other and is called an action potential. Eventually, sodium will be pumped back out of the cell and then the negative charges will be restored. So this is kind of like a domino effect. And this allows an electric gradient to um, transmit through a cell, for example, a nerve cell. Here is the inside of a nerve cell. Um, and in the top picture, you see the resting state. These purple um, things along the cell are transport molecules. 
And in the resting state, remember sodium has left the cell and potassium is coming back in, but it's slow. So the cell has this negative charge. When you have a stimulus, so when you stub your toe and you say, ouch, you pull your toe back and you pull your toe back because this action potential triggers nerves to tell your muscles to move. So when you have a stimulus, sodium quickly goes back in the cell. That sodium has a positive charge and a depolarization or a shift in the charge of the cell from negative to positive occurs. Because the cell is now very positive, the cell starts to pump out potassium and the cycle can start over. All right, electrolytes and acid-base balance. So this is a pH scale, and pH is the negative log of hydrogen ion concentration. So for each change in one pH scale, for example, going from a pH of eight to seven, there is a tenfold increase, or from seven to eight, there's a tenfold increase in the hydrogen ion concentration. And pH of the blood is very tightly regulated because if pH is too high or too low, enzymes won't function. So it's important for pH to be maintained in a very, very narrow range. Um, and this can be done by electrolytes. So I said this top part already, pH is maintained in a very narrow range. Normal body pH is 7.35 to 7.45. If your pH is too acidic, it will have a number less than 7.35, and that's considered acidosis. If your pH is too basic, it will have a number over 7.45, and that's considered alkalosis. And Regulating pH is vital to, to life, really, in, in all metabolic functions. Um, and so because it's so important, there's multiple systems that help regulate it. So electrolytes help, buffers help, our respiratory system, getting rid of CO2, taking in oxygen helps, um, our kidneys' secretion of hydrogen ions and bases help. So these are all important in acid-base regulation. Sodium. So sodium is abbreviated Na on the periodic table of elements. And sodium is found in salt, table salt. However, table salt also contains chloride. And one teaspoon of table salt has about 2,400 milligrams of sodium. Sodium is vital. We do need sodium. Remember, sodium is usually outside of the cells, and then it will rush in during that action potential to trigger a, a nerve um, impulse. Without sodium, we would not be able to conduct nervous signaling, muscle contraction, so many different things. Sodium is also important for glucose absorption. And our kidneys can function as a filter for sodium. They can either reabsorb more sodium into our bodies or sodium can be excreted in our urine. Sodium can be lost during perspiration. I'm sure you guys have all experienced this perhaps um, if your sweat has tasted salty or even burned your eyes. Getting enough sodium. So do we get enough sodium? Absolutely, we get more than enough sodium. And we're gonna see some sources coming up, but about 77% of our sodium comes from added, from foods that have added sodium and foods that are manufactured and served at restaurants. Another 11% comes from sodium that's added while cooking at home, and about 12% comes from foods naturally. Um, some foods, such as dairy products, are pretty high in sodium. What are the adequate intake levels? Adequate intake is considered 1,500. Um, and how much do we typically consume? We usually consume between 2,300 to 4,700, so we eat way too much. Is sea salt healthier? In a nutshell, the answer to this is no. Um, sea salt is 
uh, often advertised to contain many trace minerals such as magnesium, calcium, copper, zinc, etc. And it is very possible that sea salt does have those minerals. However, they are in such small amounts that they're really considered negligible to our diet. Also, you would have to eat so much sea salt to get a meaningful amount. So the mineral benefit really isn't there. Um, one thing that sea salt is usually missing is iodine. Iodine is commonly added to table salt to reduce our risk of iodine deficiency, but it is not commonly routinely added to sea salt. How about the sodium levels in sea salt versus table salt? So by weight, if you were to weigh salt, sea salt and table salt have the same amount of sodium. However, by volume, it is possible that sea salt has a little bit less sodium. So by volume, I mean maybe like a teaspoon or a tablespoon um, or a cup. And the only reason for this has to do with the size of the crystals in sea salt versus regular salt. And so this is a very expanded, blown up um, example, but sea salt crystals are pretty big. And when sea salt crystals um, are scooped up into a teaspoon or a tablespoon, because they are so big, there is space in between them where there is air. And where there is air, there is no salt. So sea salt by volume might have more air space. Because table salt is so small, when you scoop it up, it stacks pretty evenly on top of one another, and there's not much room for airspace. And so by volume, table salt might have a little bit more sodium, um, but by weight, they do not. So that's the difference. All right, additional sources of sodium from our diets. So you can see most of it comes from food processing or restaurants. Um, these are slightly different numbers than what I just told you, but that's okay. I, you won't have to memorize these numbers. We get a small percent from cooking foods at home, adding food at the table. So total, this is 11, which is the same as what I told you. They just broke it down. And then 12% from natural foods. Dairy foods, cheese, cottage cheese, even sometimes yogurt and ice cream even can be high in salt. Other foods that you may eat and percent of sodium that they have. So two pieces of pepperoni pizza, you are exceeding your adequate intakes for sodium. One slice of ham, you're almost there. Chicken noodle soup, pretty close. And then you can go down the list. Grape juice, almost none. Animal crackers, not that much. Grains, not that much. Non-fat milk, not that much. But you can see it all adds up. And the more processed foods you choose, the higher in sodium they are. All right, why should we control sodium? So like I said, sodium is essential but excess sodium can cause some problems and is associated with some problems. Some people are salt sensitive, and this means that sodium directly affects their blood sugar or their blood pressure, raising their blood pressure. And high blood pressure can put you at higher risk for stroke and heart attack. High sodium intakes can increase calcium loss in the urine, maybe linked to overweight and obesity. Um, because if people are eating high salt foods, they might get thirsty. And what kind of drinks do people usually drink when they're eating salty foods? I think that they drink like sodas and beers and juice and kind of go together. Um, maybe linked to fluid retention because water follows sodium. So the more salt you consume, the tighter your body holds on to water in order to dilute that salt so that you don't have too much salt. Potassium. So potassium is important to water balance and nerve transmission. We discussed the sodium and potassium relationship in that nerve impulse. It is positively charged and it is intracellular. So remember it starts intracellular, then it leaves the cell, and then it comes back in later. And potassium is kind of the opposite of sodium because high levels of potassium are actually associated with lower blood pressure. 
And low potassium, and I will add to this, low or high potassium can be life-threatening. Um, what they used to use in the, um, the chair that they used to use for people who were sentenced with the death penalty, they used to use potassium injections because potassium in very high quantities can stop your heart. So potassium injections straight to your bloodstream. However, low blood potassium can also stop your heart. So it's important to get just the right amount. Um, Adequate intakes are 4,700 milligrams, daily value 3,500, uh, and on average, people consume about 2,000 to 3,000. So on average, we're getting too much sodium and not enough potassium. The only people who really need to be careful with potassium foods are people with kidney disease. So these are some sources of potassium in our diets. Um, then you can see it's mostly fruits and vegetables and juices. However, dairy products as well as some protein foods do have some potassium. Chloride. So chloride is a negatively charged ion um, and it is found many places throughout the body, but one of them is stomach acid. Remember our stomach acid is HCl or hydrochloric acid. Um, it's also important to immune function. It's also important for blood pressure regulation. And it's important to our nervous system function. It is excreted in the kidneys and some of it is lost in sweat. Um, if we're vomiting a lot, it's possible to lose some because we're gonna be vomiting up that stomach acid. But generally speaking, deficiency of chloride is pretty low because when we eat table salt, table salt is actually sodium chloride. And since we eat too much table salt and salt's added to the foods that we eat, we're getting plenty of chloride. Yeah. Chloride recommendations. So there are naturally occurring sources of chloride, but like I said, most of it comes from salt that we eat. And on average, we, cons we consume way too much chloride. Um, so we are, we are eating too much chloride. And the problem with this is it can raise blood pressure. Hypertension. So hypertension, we abbreviate HTN, and hypertension is high blood pressure. Um, normal blood pressure is measured by using a blood pressure cuff um, and measuring the systolic over the diastolic blood pressure. And normal is considered 120 over 80. Prehypertension is between 120 and 140 to between 80 to 90. And then hypertension is anything over 140 and anything over 90. And if just one of these values is high, it is considered hypertension. Okay, the, what do these numbers mean? So the higher number, for example, the 120 in a normal blood pressure represents systolic blood pressure. And this is the pressure in the arteries when the heart muscle is contracting and pumping blood into the arteries. Um, second value is diastolic blood pressure, and this is the pressure when the heart is relaxed. So it's the pressure when the heart is at its max, pumping blood out, and when it is relaxed. Most people don't feel that they have high blood pressure. However, it's estimated that about one in five adults do, and in those adults over 65, about 50% do. The problem with high blood pressure is it can cause many, many issues that you don't necessarily feel that you're sick, but you actually are doing some internal damage. So it is the second leading cause of kidney disease. It can reduce brain function, put you more at risk for strokes or mini strokes, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, circulation issues, vision problems, and even death. What are the causes of high blood pressure? So there are some factors that we can control and there are some factors that we can't control. Obviously our age, we cannot control. And as we get older, we're more likely to have high blood pressure. Our family history, we cannot control. Um, smoking, we can control this. So smoking increases risk. Atherosclerosis, this is damage to the inside of our arteries. And this will increase blood pressure because the arteries become narrow. Obesity, this is something we can control for. This is the number one contributor to high blood pressure. 
and obesity causes increased insulin production, which can cause increased sodium retention and then increased water retention and can lead to high blood pressure. Inactivity can lead to high blood pressure. Excessive alcohol is responsible for about 10% of high blood pressure. Certain ethnicities are at higher risk for high blood pressure, such as African Americans, and then sodium intake. We said that 10 to 15% of people were salt sensitive. So that means that when they eat sodium, it can cause their blood pressure to go up. What can we do to reduce or control our blood pressure? There are different diet plans that can help reduce blood pressure. Uh, and one of them is called the DASH diet. So this stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And this is a diet rich in calcium, potassium, magnesium, and low in salt. It does promote low-fat dairy, vegetables, legumes, and nuts. And it is low sugar and low alcohol. And depending on how strict the salt restriction is in this DASH diet, people can reduce their blood pressure significantly. Other studies have shown that diets rich in vitamin C can be linked to reductions in blood pressure. And why would you think that this might be? The reason that I would think this could happen is because usually food sources of vitamin C are fruits and veggies. And fruits and veggies are full of antioxidants and fiber as well as potassium. So it makes sense. All right. So we're... We're here at the end, we've talked about electrolytes and we've talked about water today and these are some questions for thought and review. Thank you.